see a lot of familiar faces, but if there are those among you who are visiting, we welcome you and we ask you to continue your faith journey with, with our church family. As is our custom, we always like to open our service with the uh, passing of the peace. And I was reminded this morning at the earlier service that it's probably more appropriate to share an elbow, uh, elbow or a hand pump because we are in prime flu season. So in any event, please stand and pass the peace of the Lord. I'd like to share with you now uh, some of the concerns of the church and, and our announcements. I would call your attention to uh, the flowers on the communion table uh, presented by Bob and Polly Gross. Also, would like to welcome Reverend Carson Ryan as our minister this morning. Carson is a graduate of Presbyterian College uh, and also Union Seminary. And uh, Carson has a long history with our church, having been our moderator of our session some 30 years ago when we went through uh, the interim transition before. So Carson, we welcome you and thank you for being here. Pastoral concerns, please keep in your prayers George Raymer, who will be having uh, upcoming surgery. Also Bucky Hill, who has had surgery, and my understanding is that he is doing well. So prayers answered. Uh, please note the other announcements in the bulletin with respect to PYF and the Manna uh, yard sale. You know and I know that you have things in your house that you can get rid of and are worthy of the yard sale and Manna would love if you would contribute on that. Next Sunday is our fourth Sunday of the month and that's when we do our hunger offering. And most of you probably know the hunger offering covers a lot of areas, but one of the important areas is that it, part of it goes to the minister's discretionary fund. And at this time of year, uh, after the holidays and after the needs that have been tried to be addressed at the holidays, uh, there's always a fairly low balance in that account. So as you prayerfully consider the hunger offering next week, I hope that you will keep that in mind, that through the discretionary fund, we have an opportunity to help families within our congregation, within our community, and to do what we are asked to do as Christians. So please keep that in mind next week as we do our, our hunger offering. Also next week, there will not be a children's church, but I've been told that it will be a children's church a child-friendly service, and so uh, the, the children are welcome to stay and participate. I would like to take a couple of minutes to share with you how we got to the point of having a, a new interim minister, and I would like to introduce him to you this morning. His name is Chris Shearer, and he's here this morning with his daughter, Shiloh, Chris, would you stand up just for a second, please, and let everyone see you? I think a lot of people have actually already seen Chris. But I want to share with you as we 
begin our journey with Chris next week. Chris will be flying solo uh, in the pulpit. Um, how did we get to this point? How did we select Chris? Joyce Wick, Rick Jenkins and I were on the interim search committee and we reviewed candidates and we reviewed their references. We, we talked with six references that Chris provided. Now references can be a little sketchy sometimes and they can be a little dubious because no one really wants to say anything bad. I can assure you that all six of Chris's references were consistent and positive in their message, such as he has a shepherd's heart and the ability to relate to people from all walks of life, is very pastoral and has the ability to see and understand the big picture, is an excellent preaching pastor, very relatable, provides good themes that are based on scripture, can be self-deprecating when necessary. He is intuitive about what others need and how to help and excels in relationships. He has a passion for his work and lives his faith with love and compassion. I think those are all pretty special characteristics that we can embrace and they were consistent among the references. When we met with Chris to interview him, it was quickly apparent that it really was not an interview, it was a conversation. And that conversation lasted almost two hours. Um, that probably says a lot. Uh, Chris was very deliberative in his process of deciding where he was being called. He had other opportunities to consider we were sweating bullets at one time as he was possibly considering maybe going elsewhere. But he asked in his deliberative process, why are you calling me to come to your church? And I wanna share just two snippets of emails back and forth. We, we now have an email chain of about 50 emails, but I'm just gonna give you two little snippets. This is from Chris, as I have stated to you before, my goal is to diminish the I and make the you slash us decision. That is a choice that best answers where does God need the distinct blend of skills, experiences that I have, or which group does he need me to serve right now? So for example, the greater security of an installed position won't really play into it much if I can help it. So when he asked us, why are we calling him to this ministry? I wrote back to him and said, I will take the liberty of speaking for Joyce and Rick in response to your query. I don't know what a normal interview time is, but we had a wonderful conversation with you that lasted two hours. And perhaps that is the answer in a nutshell. You presented with an inner peace coupled with an outward energy which spoke to how you had evolved in your faith, overcome personal challenges, and weathered a ministry setting that may have caused you to ask, why me, Lord? Why here, Lord? And why now, Lord, on more than one occasion? You are a relationship builder, and building relationships is critical to an interim ministry. You bring a wonderful mix of faith, experience, and energy that our church would benefit from and grow in response to. And I feel very blessed that Chris has been brought before us to join us in our journey as a church and a congregation as we go through the interim time. And so Chris, on behalf of the congregation, I welcome you. Shiloh, thanks for coming and being his support. And we are excited to have you with us. Thank you.
Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It's he that has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Indeed, O God, you are good, far beyond good, as your steadfast love is with us for generations and forever. And our prayer is that as we come and worship, your spirit will join us. Your spirit will inspire us. Your spirit will call us to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So come, Holy Spirit, and be with us. For as we begin our worship, we begin with the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Join with me in our responsive reading, which is from Psalm 24, as we read God's word responsively. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas. And established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will receive blessing from the Lord. Such is the generation of those who seek Him. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. Who is the King of Glory? Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Amen. Amen.
claim the promise that is ours, that if we are willing to confess our sin, God is more than ready to welcome us home. Take a few moments and make your own personal confession, and then I will conclude us with a prayer of confession. Let us pray. Indeed, O oh God, we say with our lips how much we adore you and praise you and glorify your holy name. And yet sometimes our lives do not reflect that truth. We do what we ought not to do, and we know better. We do things in life that are clearly against your will. We do things in life that clearly are in opposition to your being. So as we make our own confessions, as we pray this morning, we claim that promise that if we are honest, if we are willing to confess our sin before you, that you're more than willing to accept us, forgive us, and welcome us home. So great God in heaven, hear this, our prayer, that we might have our sins forgiven for your holy name. Good news of God. the gospel is that we have been forgiven, and through that forgiveness have been given new life. Friends, believe the good news of that gospel. As the visiting fireman, we don't always do it right, but God <laughs> forgives us anyhow. Amen.
because of your love and grace for us. And so, as you have blessed us so wonderfully in all of life, we now come and share those gifts with others, that others may know the same grace and love and peace that we have. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Please be seated and invite the children to come up for our time with each other. Good morning. In most every church, Christian church, you'll always see one symbol. The cross. And up on the wall is a cross. And on the Bible is a cross. And sometimes people wear crosses as necklaces, and sometimes they wear them as pins, and they're used a lot of times. And one of the things for me is that a cross reminds me of what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. You see one of the pieces of the cross goes straight up and down, and that reminds me to love God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the other piece goes across which is a reminder that I don't just love God, but I love one another, people, family, friends, neighbors. Now, if you take off one piece, is that a cross? No. Or if you leave that piece, is, that's not a cross. But together, they remind us of what Jesus was all about, and that is loving God and loving neighbor, so that together we are able to live out the cross of Christ. So every time you see a cross, Remember that little story about the fact that it tells us what we're supposed to do as Christians. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for reminders of how we're to live our lives as Christians and how we're to love you and love each other. Gracious God, help us to do it. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you all. Now, do you all go to Children's Church? You know, you, you know the routine. Good, good, good. <laughs> Thank you. 
I want to express my appreciation for the invitation to be with you today before your interim pastor begins, and it's delightful to be with you. Since the last time I was, I was here, you moved the pulpit, and I thought, <laughs> I don't know if I can handle this or not. And if you thought my mess up about the prayer of confession was bad, I really blew it at 8.30. <laughs> I introduced uh, Chris and his wife, <coughs> not knowing it was his daughter. <laughs> And his comment to me when we came out after service, and I apologize, he said, I married young. <laughs> I said, so it, just, um, it was just good to be with him and also to be with you. And also to say that this congregation is really blessed with the music. It's a phenomenal gift. It's just wonderful. Because um, all of our congregations aren't that way. Since I go around every week, I get to see everything. Uh, but you really are blessed. And at 8.30, when they said they had a choir at 8.30, I said, that's just almost anti-Presbyterian. <laughs> so thank you. All. I know you put in a lot of time, a lot of hours. Thank you for all you do, because it really makes worship worship, I think. Our scripture lessons are Old and New Testament, jo Jonah in chapter 3 and Mark in chapter 1. I would appreciate it if you have your pew Bibles to turn with me. Jonah chapter 3, the first five verses, and the tenth verse, and then Mark chapter 1. While you're turning to it, one other disclaimer is I had cataract surgery, so I can see all of you on the back row if you start nodding, <laughs> but I can't see anything right in front of me, so I, I have these glasses that I, they come and go, and so just bear with me with these things. Jonah 3, verses 1 through 5, listen for God's word. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he cried, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And when God saw what they had done, how they turned from their evil ways, God repented of the evil which he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Then from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, beginning with verse 14 of that particular chapter, listen now for God's word. And after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. To God be the praise and honor and glory for this God's word for us, God's people. Amen. I don't think there's anything much better than the ending to a good story. An ending that kind of wraps everything together and you know where they were headed. An ending in which you identify with the characters and it all comes together. An ending in which they all live happily ever after. Well, I think the passages that I've just read to you are that kind of ending, good ending of a story. From Jonah when it said that God saw what they had done, how they had turned from their evil ways, and God decided not to do what he was going to do to them. 
And in Mark's gospel, when he called on Simon and Andrew, and they dropped their nets and immediately followed Jesus at the call of Jesus. And then the James and John left their father in the boat with the hired hands, and they left and went to follow Jesus. It seems like they're just kind of perfect endings to stories of what it means to be a disciple of Christ, almost storybook-like in their appeal and their nature. They're kind of the ways that many of us imagine what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, where you literally give up everything, you drop what you're doing, and you go off into the sunset with Jesus to a whole new way of life, as if it were the way it happened in the movie. We declare that being a disciple of Christ has never been so easy and appears effortless on the part of these new disciples. Just off, walk off with Jesus and start a whole new life and everything's going to be great. Except it just never happens to us. For a real struggle for many of us is being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the question is, are you willing to give up all you've got? Are you willing to walk away from family, from your livelihood, from your friends, maybe even from your church? Are you willing to turn all that loose in order to follow this man of Nazareth into a new life? Well, before we get too agitated about that, I think we need to look at what the Scripture says here in Mark's Gospel to see if it can't give us some new insights about that. Jesus, we're told, comes into Galilee, and he's preaching the Gospel that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then you see what he does immediately after he makes that declaration. He begins to say that the kingdom of God is here. It's real. The kingdom of God is not something we're just talking about. It means that there's going to be a change in people's lives. There's going to be a difference from the way you've always been. It's the inauguration of a whole new era in which God is in charge, and you and I are no longer in charge. Life is going to be different, and we're going to live life in a whole new way. And right there is where most of us have the struggle. We don't believe Jesus. We don't believe the kingdom of God is here. We don't believe that things are going to be different. We don't believe that we're going to have to change ourselves. For we're wearing those same old set of glasses of suspicion and skepticism and prejudice about the fact that anything has changed, that nothing has been any different, and we just don't believe. Well, when you start with that kind of perspective, it's hard to hear the rest of the story. Because right after that, Jesus turns to James and John, to Simon and Andrew, and goes to them and says, follow me. And they immediately drop everything and take off after him. For something happened to them, and their lives were changed forever. But it seems to me that the same is true for us. When we hear the call of Christ, there's no time to bargain. There's no time to negotiate there's no time to make a deal with Jesus. It's just a time to drop it and go. Respond to Christ fully and completely and declare that you now are under his obedience and under his direction. But how many of us put it off? How many of us say, oh, not now. I got some work I got to do. I got to finish this job. How many of us say that, nope, not now because I've got children and so we've got to raise them. How many of us just resist it all the time when Jesus comes to us and when Jesus speaks to us? For you see, Jesus enters our world. He comes to us and says, I want you, and you are to follow me. And yet, that's part of what many of us can't believe. You notice in the story, Jesus approached these four men. They were just doing their job. They were not even doing trouble. They weren't even causing problems. They were just simply doing their job, living out their faith, and he bust into their lives, to their livelihood, to the very, th very thing that they do every day. And that's where I think a lot of us miss and cannot comprehend this truth. 
For we in the South have been sold a bill of goods that you've got to walk the sawdust trail. You've got to somehow get your life right before God's going to get right with you. You've got to clean up your act. And all of us got a lot to clean up, I know. But many of us think that God is not going to even give us the time of day till we finally get our stuff right. And we are just dead wrong. For this story illustrates the fact that Jesus takes the initiative. Jesus starts all of this. Jesus comes into their lives, and Jesus calls them to be a disciple. But isn't that the way Jesus does it? Isn't it when we are not expecting Jesus, he kind of shows up? Isn't it when we think everything is going hunky-dory, Jesus kind of interferes in our lives? When we're not expecting him, not ready for him, he kind of busts into it. For I think that's the way Jesus did with these disciples, and I think that's the way he does with us. And oftentimes we're shocked at his presence. He calls us from our daily routines. He calls us from those patterns we do day after day and says it's time for you to have a difference and for your life to be different and invites us to join him in a whole new way of living life and being a disciple of Christ. I think we oftentimes get it wrong, for we're expecting some mountaintop experience when Jesus kind of bolts into us. We're expecting to be like Paul, who gets struck down and is blinded on the way to Damascus. We expect some unbelievable, incredible event to occur, and Jesus then calls us as his disciples. But I want to suggest that this story provides a different avenue, a different approach, a different way for us to be disciples of Christ. For I think this story is saying that Jesus comes to us wherever we are. That may be at home, it may be at work, it may be with friends, you may just be sitting by yourself. And Jesus calls us by name and says, follow me. He wants us to be one of his disciples and to be a servant of Christ. He wants us to share this good news that we want to share so badly. He wants us to be able to live that kind of life. And he's not calling us to be a preacher or a minister or anybody religious, but someone who has such joy in their hearts, they want to share this good news. Yesterday I was at the uh, gym and was in the hot tub with this woman who I'd never met before, and she had these things on her knees. They were kind of crossed, and I said, what are those? And she said, they were case strips. I said, what's that? Well, she gave me this long dissertation about how great these were because her knee was kind of weak and she put it on there. And it just hit me that she was so positive about these case strips that you can buy 20 in a box if you want to know that. I mean, I got all the details <laughs> about it. That, that it has strengthened her knee to the point that she really can do things she hadn't done before. And I thought, that's what we're called to be, not K-Strip advertisers, <laughs> but advertisers for Jesus, that we want to so much share the good news of what's happened in our lives that others want to hear it and we share it with them. I was just taken with her in enthusiasm about these K-Strips and thought, can we plant that in some of our Christian hearts, that same level of enthusiasm and excitement? And it happens whenever you call someone that you've been thinking about and hadn't heard from them recently. It happens whenever you send a check to an important Christian cause that you want to support and to help build up. It happens when you talk to a friend at work just to say, how's everything going? Are you okay? It happens when you work with a young person here at church or in other settings to help give them a different kind of life. It happens whenever you send a note to a friend that you just hadn't thought about for a while. It happens when you speak the truth and love to someone who needs to hear that because their life has gone off the rails. All of which is a response to the call of Jesus. It may be Jesus nudging you. It may be Jesus pushing you. It may be Jesus cracking you over the head. But nevertheless, it's a response to the call of Christ in your life to make a difference with someone else. Like the brothers, you are responding to the call of Christ because you believe in this kingdom 
You believe in this new life. You believe in this joy that comes to us because of who Jesus Christ is. It's a whole new direction for your life because Jesus has claimed you in your baptism and you're his. And our response is to respond to that incredible call on our lives. It's a new kingdom. You are a new person. There's a whole new day in front of you of what might come next. Now I go from preaching to meddling. I always like to warn people about that, but that's one of the things I do. We have a problem in the church. We have a lot of folks in the church that are, quote, members of the church. But I wonder, are they disciples of Christ? We do a lot of work and activity in the church to keep the members happy, to have pew cushions so you feel comfortable, to do all these kind of extraneous things. But are we working to develop disciples of Jesus Christ? We in the church desire to have more members. And the folks in the community just want to make a difference in this community. We in the church feel the need to maintain our traditions and our ways of doing things. And people in the community just want to know something about this Jesus. We in the church have an ordered worship service. And this morning when they played the guitar, I could not believe it. I thought it was wonderful that that kind of innovation was going on in Culpeper Church. And yet, oftentimes, our worship doesn't speak to them. In many places, we work hard to keep the traditions and protocols in place, and those simply are not speaking to folks in our day and time. We desire organ music, and some people just want a guitar. We want choir robed out, and some people just want someone that can sing. We want things in our church to be the way they've always been because that's the way you're supposed to do it, and others are just not up for that. It seems to me that the Culpeper Church is in an enviable position. You've been blessed with a long-term pastorate. 28 and a half years Wayne was with you, and that's just unheard of. We do have a pastor in one of our churches who is at year 41 in his church. In fact, he was sent there, uh, Shady Clark was sent there to close the church. And they're a thriving congregation 41 years later. Wayne blessed you in his work here. And the church here is steady and the church is consistent and the church here is solid. As um, Mort said earlier, some 30 years ago, I moderated your session when I was at the Summit Church and helped to get to about uh, Davis Thomas to come as your interim pastor. And that was a wonderful time for him and his wife, as well as for his grandchildren in Richmond. So it was a double feature, it seemed to me. But now is an opportunity to explore what it means for this church to have members or have disciples. It's a great time to explore in this transition what God is calling Culpeper Presbyterian Church to be and to do. What is your niche as a congregation? What do people think of when they think of Culpeper Presbyterian Church in this town? It'd be interesting to do a little survey and ask people, what do they think about the Culpeper Church? What comes to mind when that name comes up? The, tradition, the, the transition time provides an opportunity to claim your identity and your call from God and to define very clearly who you are and whose you are. It's a time to prepare for the new pastor who will come, and you need to be clear about who you are and what God is calling you to do. So my challenge to you in this transition time is to grab hold of God and grab hold of God's discerning power to define who the Culpeper Presbyterian Church is. Look at everything around here that's, quote, normal, and put it up against whether that means being a disciple of Christ. Look at everything you always have done around here, the seven last words of Christ. Seems to me we've always done it that way. And see, do we keep doing that? Or is it time for some things to be turned loose and new things to be embraced? Test everything against the test of whether it means being a disciple of Jesus Christ. For in so doing, you will leave some things behind and you will pick up on some others. 
seems to me that you're not in a holding pattern. This could be one of the most exciting times in the life of a church as you discern what God is calling you to be and to do. And when Chris starts this week as your interim pastor, you and he have got a ton of work to do. To work to see what God is calling you to be and calling you to do into the future. And I would suggest God's future, not Culpeper Church's future, God's future for this congregation. And while you seek that future, just remember that Jesus is the one coming to you. He's already stirring up the pot, probably right here. He's already challenging you in his own way. He's already calling you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in a new and exciting way. He's already declaring, follow me. And the issue is, what's going to be your response? Are you going to just simply sit? Or are you going to respond and follow him in some new and exciting ways in order to glorify the creator of this universe? God's blessings on you in this transition as you seek things that you never thought possible for God's glory and God's praise. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for times of life in which we can stop and assess who we are, determine what you're calling us to be, and allow us to be that new creation in Jesus Christ. So be with the Culpeper Church as she goes through this transition, as she seeks your will and your way, as she attempts to be that faithful congregation she has been for all these years as we enter a new era and a new time in order to serve you more faithfully. In the name of the Christ, we make our prayer. Amen. We declare what we believe, and today we'll use the Apostles' Creed as we stand and say what our faith is. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
four disciples we've been called by God to Jesus Christ to be disciples and to go and to show the way. So as you do that, take into the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.